denial of service and what they call proof of concept exploits. So a lot of times if you understand the way that protocols work, I read white papers, I do technical edits for technical books. I go through the white paper and it says, um, and an example I always do is multicast. There's kind of a fun bug that I found once on the Cisco ASA <clears throat> and it allowed me to do denial of service. I'll tell you a little bit about it. I was doing a technical edit of a book and the author of the book says multicast is always, and I'm going to put this in big bold print <clears throat> and underline it, a destination. And it goes on even further to say it's never a source. And I try not to be like a really nasty tech editor. If people say something and I read it and I'm like, ooh, that's not accurate. I'm like, is it completely wrong or is it a little bit gray? Because if it's a little bit gray, I'm not gonna put up a big fight. I might put it in a light comment or suggestion to clarify it, but there's just too many battles, right? However, when I see someone use the word always and never, I cringe as an engineer because I'm like, ooh, if I use the word always for anything, there's always an exception. There's always that one alternative where the rules don't work the way you think they would. So to say something is always absolutely going to happen in a certain way, I cringe a little bit. So this was just one sentence of one paragraph of one chapter of one book. But when I read it, I go, ooh. Now I know multicast is from one to many. And it doesn't make sense that it would ever go from many to one. You wouldn't want that, that's not how it works. But multicast, which is its own class of IP address called class D, goes from 224 to 239 in the first octet. So you ever see an IP address that starts with 224 to 239? Those are multicast addresses. And this book says it's always a destination, it's never the source, it's how I could stream music to a bunch of people without wasting a lot of bandwidth. That's how it's supposed to work. But who's to say <clears throat> that I couldn't come along with a packet crafting utility like HPing or Scappy and come in here to the source address and say 225.5.5.5. I could absolutely do that. And I can put the destination as your firewall. And that's exactly what I did. And I first started um, looking at the Cisco ASA. And the way that the Cisco ASA works is he uses a feature called unicast reverse path forwarding. And what unicast reverse path forwarding does is it looks at the computer's routing table. And if you've got, let's say, 10.0.0.0 slash 8 on the inside, it says everything with the 10 address is to the right. So if I ever see a packet coming from the 10 address from let's say the internet, that's somebody spoofing and I should throw it away. In other words, unicast reverse path forwarding prevents spoofing by logically looking at the source address of a message, comparing it to the routing table and going, is this coming from where it should be coming from? Is that where that network really lives? And if it doesn't, it throws it away. Here's the thing about unicast reverse path forwarding it leverages your IP routing table. And not to go into too much detail about networking, but multicast is handled in a different routing table called a multicast routing table. So when you try to do a lookup of a multicast address in an IP routing table, as, as niche and goofy as that sounds, guess what happens? Core dump. The operating system for the firewall completely crashed. It hit the floor. It takes all the memory, which is like eight gigs of RAM, and it totally writes the memory to flash. It does a core dump, and then it reboots. <clears throat> this took one simple packet, teeny tiny, but because of a flaw in the way unicast reverse path forwarding works, when it tried to valid a packet, that technically should never exist, <clears throat> but it could. That's all it took 
to crash the most popular firewall on the internet. Now when people deploy these, they put them out in pairs so that you can do updates for resiliency, for failover. But both pairs are supposed to be running the same operating system version. The same operating system version has the same vulnerabilities. So <clears throat> kind of pulling this back full circle, there's different ways to do denial of service. One, you get a botnet, which is a bunch of compromised servers. You tell them, hey, botnet, generate tons and tons of requests and flood those guys. All those requests come and go, and you can handle it or you can't. A lot of times what you do is you either pay ransom to the people that are trying to do extortion against you that are dosing you, or you pay somebody else like Cloudflare, and you go, you guys have your engineers work with our engineers, <coughs> Try to identify malicious traffic, throw away anything that looks bogus. And then they've got to do tons of traffic analysis and do hands-on response and try to fix it for you. So it's costing you money one way or the other. And it's all about just tons and tons and tons of requests. What's so cool, I think about denial of service attacks versus DDoS, is we're finding flaws in the way devices work. I target routers, switches, firewalls, wireless LAN controllers, and load balancers. Um, and IP cameras. I think there's nothing sexier than hacking security devices. And, you know, am I hacking it? Am I getting root on the firewall? No, but some people are. There's vulnerabilities where you can hack the firewall and actually take it over, run your own software, get in the Linux subsystem, um, on Palo Alto, on ASAs. But I'm not that good. I don't know how to build the exploit codes and the payloads to do that. It's very difficult. Um, much more so than just doing a reg regular Linux server. That said, I can still create error conditions that cause systems to break, and that's what denial of service is. So kind of coming back over here um, and here, when we look at denial of service <clears throat> and what they call proof of concept exploits, a lot of times these are bugs that other researchers have discovered and they go, hey, here's Kaspersky antivirus for Linux. We found a way to do memory corruption. <clears throat> now, someone who's a more sophisticated attacker might come through this, look at the way that it works, and go, you know what? I can take this attack, and instead of just crashing, which is normally what happens when you find a software vulnerability and you trigger it, it just causes the system to crash. But if you're really good, and you can crash it in a very specific way, which we're gonna get into tomorrow, we can perform remote exploitation. 